Welcome to uh, the third week of Space Science Beyond the Dome. Uh, my name is, oops, I haven't started my video yet. There we go. Aha, much better. Uh, my name is Keith Davis, and I'm the director of the Digital Visualization Theater, DVT, at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, what that is, is a 50-foot dome that we can project just about anything onto. And what we usually do with that is a simulation of the night sky and a flight through, um, the universe, basically. Now, of course, while everyone is shut down, uh, we can't have visitors at our facility. So what I thought I would do is, so this series is to share some of the things that I've learned with all of you. Um, and so thank you all for joining me. I'm glad that you're here. I'm gonna ask everyone to stay on mute, but please feel free to uh, type any questions that you have in the chat. You don't have to wait for a particular moment. You can ask whatever you would like, whenever you like. Um, Rose Kelly is uh, one of the people that you will see there. She is an undergraduate student at the University of Notre Dame. She is one of my student employees and she helps me when I uh, build things for the DVT, when I add things into the DVT, and when we present in the DVT as well. Um, so you will see her here and it looks like one of my other students just joined. Let me go ahead and make Zoe Serma a co-host as well. So either of them, um, if I get kicked off the internet for some reason, as happened last week, uh, they should be able to at least answer some basic questions or maybe um, just talk about what it's like to be a student at the DVT or show some other things, okay? So it should be, though, even if I do get kicked off, it shouldn't be for much more than a couple of minutes. All right, so today, let's go ahead and bring up my screen. get back up off of that link. Seeing my presentation in reverse. Okay, can I, hopefully everybody can see the screen. Let me bring my chat up so I can see if anybody's talking. Although Rose will read stuff if it looks like I've missed it. I don't know if any of you have presented with Zoom, but when you have it in full screen mode, uh, it's hard, to, you can't, it doesn't let you see your mouse. So it's hard to know what to click. Let's go ahead and do that. There we go, now we're set up, right? Okay, so today what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to update you on a few things that have been happening in the night sky. I mentioned a couple of things that I talked about last week and update us all on those. I'm also going to use today to talk a little about gravity and about how uh, the motion of things in space works because we've been talking a lot about comets and asteroids and so I want to talk a little about how those things move and I have a really fun toy that you can all play with uh, via in just a normal browser you don't even have to download any uh, anything so I'm going to show you how that works and uh, play a little with that and encourage you to play with that on your own later so uh, remember that two of the tools that I most often use are uh, NASA's Eyes and uh, Stellarium Web. Both of these are free and downloadable. Uh, the web actually is, is another tool that you don't need to download. Uh, Stellarium Web you can just run in a browser. I actually like the interface in the browser a little better, although there's more things in the downloadable version and you have more control over it. The new tool I'm going to add today is from Minute Labs. And if you've seen the YouTube channel uh, Minute Physics or Minute Earth, it's from the same people that do those. And I highly recommend both of those. Minute Physics does uh, great little drawings of pretty complex physics ideas, but often makes them very easy and fun to understand. Um, and they're really, the, the episodes are usually not more than five minutes at a time, so it's a really quick watch. I like to watch those uh, while I'm eating lunch at my desk sometimes. Um, and uh, the, but Minute Earth is more about like nature, um, uh, the planet, sometimes geology, but a lot of times it's biology and animals and, and how those natural things work. So that's a lot of fun too. Um, but today what we're going to use is, if you're interested in playing with this on your own, if you look at the bottom of this screen in the center, you will see something labeled chaotic planets. That's what I'll be showing you later. But I wanted to go ahead and show you this now so we could see that. Um, now, a couple of things. Let me switch over. So the first thing I have to update you on is, I may have mentioned this last week. Let me switch over 
to my, here we are. So I mentioned last week, where is it? You'd think I'd get this organized for you. Here we are. Um, that there was an asteroid that was going to fly by Earth. Now, I had talked about a comet too, but remember an asteroid and a comet are very different things. They're both stuff in space, but an asteroid is a very solid material rock. These are often made out of silicate rocks, like a lot of the rocks on Earth. Uh, some of them have a lot more iron and nickel in them than a lot of rocks on Earth do, so they're really massive and really dense. Um, but they're really very much a rock, and they don't melt and puff up like a comet does. So asteroids are never visible without a telescope. Um, but we just this morning had uh, an asteroid called 1998 OR2 fly by the Earth, and it came within about 5 million miles of the Earth. And your brain is probably saying, five, 5 million miles, that can't be close, right? That's 5 million miles. But remember, we're talking about things in space, and space is really, really big. So remember that uh, the distance between the Earth and the Sun is about 93 million miles. Um, so 5 million miles can be pretty close relative to uh, the Earth. And you can see here, if you look at this view of the solar system, you should be able to see if I can get us all nice and zoomed in how over the last couple of days, it zipped by, let's go to, are we on today? So that should have zipped right by the Earth, and that was its close approach this morning. Now, um, the five million miles is are really about, think of it as like 18 moon orbits, if I'm remembering my numbers correctly. So uh, pretty close, but not so close that we would worry that it was gonna hit us. But the reason that we track an asteroid like this is because we want to measure its position very, very carefully because if it encounters anything that pushes it a little bit, that pushes it in the right direction, it could hit us. And we really want to be sure that this asteroid, which is called a potentially hazardous asteroid, is an asteroid that we watch very carefully. We don't think it's any, in any danger of hitting us, uh, but we do think that it could be, so we want to watch it throughout the future. And it's just part of what we do to try to pay attention to what's in space and take care of ourselves. So that was uh, 1998 OR2, an asteroid that flew by the Earth this morning, exactly as predicted, and just did just fine and didn't hit us. Now, there is a great little image over here on CNN about it. This is a radar image, and it looks kind of like not what you would see with your eyes. And remember that that's because it's using radar, which is not the kind of light that our eyes see. Radar is a form of light that we usually think of as, as being similar to the radio band, but it's not the kind of light that your eye can see. Um, we use radar in space sometimes because it's a very good way to measure the distance to something very, very accurately. You send out a pulse, it hits the object and comes back. Um, and you can measure where it is very accurately, and that's, uh, that's a good way to do it. Now, this, one of the scientists that was looking at it noticed that this shadow happened to look a, look a little like a mask that a lot of us are wearing right now. So it's kind of a fun little coincidence that it happened to look like a mask. Uh, and a lot of us have to wear masks right now as we go out in public to try to protect uh, from infecting anybody. Um, but uh, it did exactly what it was supposed to do. Uh, the one other thing that I thought was really interesting about it is that if we come back over to the, this is the Jet Propulsion Laboratory's Horizon Solar Dynamics, or Solar System Dynamics website, where you can type in the name of an asteroid or a comet or anything you might be interested in and get some information about where it is. And all of this is very, very technical. <laughs> Uh, these are some of the, these are the numbers that describe how the orbit works. I'm not going to go into those, but I realized that there was a thing at the bottom that I've never seen before that said show close approach data. Of course, if I click it to close it, it should close. Well, we'll leave it open. Uh, oh, there it closed. And then if I click it, so now it says show close approach. If I click it, it opens up this list. And this is all of the calculated times that that asteroid will get close to us. And so it tells you things like, or, and not just us, but other bodies as well. So this object flies by the Earth. It also flies by Jupiter. You can see what its uh, 
distances, what its minimum distance is, what its maximum distance is, what its speed relative to that object would be, uh, and a lot of other things. And I think that's really neat. You can just click on this website and see that. So we can see that, you know, uh, it flew by Earth in 1906. We didn't even know it existed then. Uh, it, flew, it flew by in 2009. Uh, this is April 29th, that's of course this morning, and then the next time it will fly by is May 18th of 2031, and that time it will be quite a bit farther away than it was this time, so it won't be nearly as close of a flyby. You can see that today it was 0.04 astronomical units, next time it's going to be 0.12, but it's kind of neat to be able to see that pretty, pretty easily just by looking on a computer screen. Okay. So that's OR2, um, and now I'd like to come back to Comet Swan. And if you remember from last time, Comet Swan was a comet that we were hoping was going to be visible to the naked eye. And that means visible without a telescope. Now, we did have an earlier comet, Atlas, that we hoped was going to become visible, but it broke up, and I talked about that last week. So as it got close to the sun, uh, it got melty, and it broke up, and so it's not going to be as bright as we wanted. But Swan is still getting brighter. It hasn't broken up, and it's just now starting to get visible without a telescope. And as of this morning, so let's take a look at its orbit first. So you can see there, let's, what date are we on? That's in July. Let's come back to today. Whoops, I went a little too far. Oh, okay, so that's in a few days. Let's come back to today. So if you look at where it is today, I'm gonna zoom in here. You can see that Comet Swan is on this really big, long orbit like that. So it just comes in close to the sun, probably just this once, and then goes out really far. We zoom in, we can see that right now it's below the plane of the solar system. It's about to come up, we'll loop around the sun and come back the other direction. So if I zoom in, we can see that over the next few days, if I skip ahead day by day, we can see that the Earth and Comet Swan are getting closer to each other, and it's going to move into a position that makes it brighter and easier to see, especially for those of us living in the Northern Hemisphere. And there you can see it's crossed to the north, and you would look up, uh, sort of north to see it from Earth. Uh, and then we can keep stepping through that over the next couple of months. So that's Comet 2020 F8 Swan, it is getting brighter. Now, according to an observer in the Southern Hemisphere, where'd that go? Uh, let me switch back over to here again. Can you see that on the screen? So, uh, oh, first of all, I wanna show you this. Um, last week, I had the pleasure of showing you some data taken by the Sarah Elkers Managed Telescope, which is on the rooftop of Jordan Hall of Science at Notre Dame campus. Um, uh, Professor Jonathan Krass again offered us another image. This time it's of OR2. So that asteroid that we were talking about zips through. I see somebody drawing on the screen. Uh, I'm gonna, yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for clearing that off. All right. Uh, so let's go ahead and do this again. Um, so this is the, the asteroid that I was just telling you about, taken by one of our own telescopes. You can see that it's just a bright little blob. It doesn't look like a rock. You can just see that it's reflecting some light from the sun there. But of course, you can see it moving past the other stars. That's how we know that an object like this, like a comet or an asteroid, is in our solar system, because they seem to move compared to the very, very far away background stars. All right, let's go forward. So, okay, so. This is a report by John Drummond. I don't know John Drummond. I've never heard of him before, but he posted this to his website. This is an image that he took of Comet Swan. This is the comet I was talking about. So he says, hi, I just came in from observing C2020 F8 with a naked eye. Uh, that means without a telescope on uh, this morning. Uh, it seems to have increased brightness dramatically since I last observed it a few nights ago. It was magnitude 11.6, which is much too dim for you to see without a telescope. The tail is very pronounced on tonight's CCD images. You can see the tail on the bottom portion of this image, the bottom right. Um, uh, and it says, uh, an image is attached, gives us some technical information. And then it says, 
just prior to astronomical twilight, I could see it naked eye with averted vision. Magnitude appears to be about 5.5. So generally, the magnitude system is backwards, meaning that a bigger number is a dimmer object. So 11.6 is pretty dim. It's way too dim for the human eye to see. But most people can see somewhere around six and a half to six is when they start to be able to see. And so five and a half would be brighter than that. So it would be visible to many of us. Now I want to point out that he says that he saw it with averted vision. And that means that he didn't look right at it. One of the things about the way the eye works is the center of your vision is very, very good at visual detail, and it is very good at uh, color. Your peripheral vision is very good at movement, and it is very good at bright and dark differences, but it is not as good as color. There's kind of a trade-off in the way your, your eye works. So sometimes when you look right at something, it's too dim to see, but if you look a little to the left or right, and we call that averting your vision, if you look a little to the left or right, you can see the difference because your eye is better at seeing um, brightness differences off axis or kind of in your periphery. So what that means is if you decide to go out and look for this uh, comet, you may want to look at a star chart, see where you think it should be, look at it, and then move your eye a little to the left, but pay attention to the peripheral, and then you are more likely to be able to see it because that part of your eye is better at seeing. And that's something astronomers get trained to do, but it's not that hard. You just look at it and then look, move your vision a little to the left or the right, and then see if you can see it in your peripheral. Okay, so, but this is really, really, really exciting. We haven't had a visual comet that you could see without a telescope in a very long time, uh, and it's kind of exciting to have this. Now, if you do decide to go see it, I encourage you to go to the darkest place you can. Please maintain the suggestions that we have of staying away from other people. Um, just go with your family, but find yourself a dark place, maybe one of the uh, uh, parks, if there are parks open at night. I'm gonna ask people to please stop drawing on the screen. I know that's fun, but it's a little distracting for everyone. Um, let's go ahead, can I, let's, Turn that off there. All right. So uh, what we've got is, um, okay, so how would you find this comet if you wanted to see it? Let's see. Let's... So here is an image of, let me clear all the drawings we have there. Okay. So uh, this is a projection of where the comet will be, and it's marked with the comet, so, or with the constellation. So, sorry, yeah, comet. So you can see there that Pisces is about where it will be in, say, a week or so, and then it's going to move up through Triangulum and over into these other, and, that, and Perseus, that can be a little hard to find. Um, but what I want to show you is, how, where this, how this would look on, here it is, on Stellarium. So if we go back to Stellarium web and we go to now, uh, we can see we're looking east. We see I've got the, the constellations labeled. Let me go ahead and move that. Let's turn those off for a second. Now, if I move the sky to later in the evening, you can see that we have Vega, a very bright star, rising over there in the east. Now, I should be able to find Aquarius. So I'm going to label the Aquarius constellation. And then if I look around in here, and this should help you find it. Ah, if I zoom in enough, it brings up Comet Swan. I'm going to select that. So the way I found that is just I knew it was an Aquarius. That helped me kind of find where it was. And then I um, zoomed in enough and the system highlighted it automatically and now I've clicked it. So if we come back here and move us through the night. You can see that it's below the graph. Uh, even though it's dark, we can't see it because the earth is in between us and it. And then if we watch and wait until the morning, we see that just as it starts to rise, the sun rises and outshines it. So where we live on the earth, we can't see it today. 
But if I advance the date, you're going to see that it's moving further north. I back up time to early in the morning. In a few days, we should just get a glimpse of it just before the sun rises. So unfortunately, this is not a convenient just after sunset object. This is a get out of bed very early in the morning object, which is a lot of what astronomy requires sometimes. So if you want to see this, you have to get up before the sun rises and see it. But you'll look to the east where it rises. And then over the course of the next couple of weeks, it's going to move. Unfortunately, it's never going to be very high. So it's always going to be very early in the morning here. Um, and uh, up into, and you can see it will even start going back down again after about the 16th. So it's only going to be super low in the sky. So it's never going to be easy to see. So you'll want to get yourself somewhere high, like on a hilltop, um, and look to the east and see if you can find it there. Now, I'm going to turn on the constellations. So you can see, let's back up a few days to say the 10th. So you can see, you'll need to be able to identify where it is. And the best way to do that is with a finder chart. So how do you find a finder chart? Um, I found this site on theskylive.com. And I don't really know this site, but it looks like the information is probably pretty good. It has a lot of information about it. So if you look right here, um, this is what's called a finder chart. Now, when you're looking at something in the sky, often the most exciting things you're looking for are the things that aren't very bright. So it's not like you can just walk out and see it. A lot of times what you need to do is look at where it's going to be, find some bright stars nearby to orient yourself, and then kind of scan with your eyes or with your binoculars where you think it's going to be. So I would find the constellation Cetus here, or uh, I think this is Perseus here, and uh, try to look in between the two bright stars and look up a little bit. Um, or maybe these two stars in Aquarius there. Um, if I come down this way, uh, this is another example of the same thing. But I think this site will update where it's going to be as we look into the future, um, as it moves. So you should be able to find it. And I think this is not the only site that will have that information. Lots of places will be publishing it. So if you, the key, magic, you know how when you Google something, you always need kind of the right magic keywords. The magic keywords would be C2020 F8 Comet Swan and then finder chart. So finder chart is the thing you want to find and you should find a good example of something that will help you find the right constellations and then find the object in the constellation. So I think that's the way to go. Also, these days, many apps might allow you to just search for it. And many of those, if you've got a phone with a GPS in it, you can hold it up and it will show you what you should be able to see in the sky as you move it around because it can kind of tell where you're holding it. Uh, and what that will do is that can make it a lot easier too. Um, but this is a good way if you don't have a um, uh, uh, phone that's like that. Um, you can also find this, you can print it out. Um, and then use, I often recommend it, you want your eye to be dark adapted so you can use a red flashlight or a lot of times your phone can be turned into kind of a red flashlight as well. So that's how you would do that. Um, also, please, if you go out, uh, try to uh, continue to maintain the distancing we need to keep the, the uh, uh, virus, to keep from catching or transmitting the virus. Um, but you can say you should be able to go out to some places uh, as long as you stay away from other people and take a look at these, you should be pretty safe to do that. So that would be lots of fun. All right. Oh, here's an interesting view of its brightness. It looks like, oh, that's the distance from Earth. Where's the brightness view? I had a brightness graph, which was interesting too. Ah, here's the brightness graph. So you can see if I zoom this in down on this week's month, you can see this is a brightness graph. So it looks like it's not going to get super bright. But one of the things about comets is they're very, very, very hard to predict. So keep an eye out. And I will definitely let you all know if it, um, if it gets even brighter than this and gets easier to see. Still pretty faint, but uh, should be able to see it without a telescope. Okay, that's my update on some of the things happening in the sky right now. Uh, what I would like to do next is, if I can bring up my chat window so I can see 
uh, questions. Someone asked about star app suggestions. I'll be honest with you, I don't have a favorite. Um, I think if you just uh, go into whatever app store, whether you're on Android or iOS or whichever, um, and look at like astronomy, I would trust, uh, I think probably just looking at the ratings there. I, I can't remember the one that I've used in the past. So I don't really have a favorite. They're all pretty good. Um, and I think you can probably trust some of the reviews on that pretty easily. All right, let's go ahead and, okay, now what I want to do is start talking about gravity. And so to show you that, we're going to switch over to one of my favorite things. And if I stop this, so um, if you look off to the right, and I am actually going to go ahead and expand this so it covers my whole screen. All right, this is a gravity simulation tool. Um, and it's not the kind of scientific tool that an astronomer would use to answer science questions, but it is a great way to play and get a sense of, get an intuitive feel for how uh, gravity works. And I've, I've lost many an afternoon goofing around with this thing because it kind of makes a fun game. Um, so what do we have here? Uh, we have a series of blobs. If I click on a blob, on the right, it tells me the mass, and it doesn't have any units. As we know, as good scientists, we could always have units, but this one I think is scaled, so the units aren't super important, but let's just say it's stellar units. Let's say it's star masses. So this is 100 star masses, whereas this littler object is only a tenth of a star mass. That's as small as this system will let you go. Um, but they're set up to be a fairly familiar system. So if I start simulating here, you can see that we have a big star in the middle. We have a smaller planet orbiting. We have another planet orbiting a little farther out. And then we have a planet with a little planet orbiting it. Uh, does that remind anybody of anything in our own sort of backyard, so to speak? To me, it looks like we've got a Mercury, we've got a Venus, and we've got an Earth with a moon. We don't have any of the outer planets here, but we've got that there. Um, let's go ahead and stop that again. So uh, what you can see of these arrows are the arrows are the velocity. So I'm actually going to clear this and break it down to just one single thing. So uh, what do you know about an object in space? You can type your answer into the chat. If we were to let a single object in space just be there, maybe if we gave it a push, but then stopped pushing on it, what would its path be like? Does anybody know what kind of path you take if you were just an object in space with nothing pushing or pulling on you? See one response, we got any others? Yeah, it looks like people have got the right idea. It goes straight. So it just goes in a straight line. And that means that it goes at the same speed and it doesn't turn. So when something is not being pushed on, it neither uh, speeds up or slows down, nor does it turn. And that is a pretty boring place to be, but it's a good place to start because of all of our other motions are going to be based on that idea that that is the natural motion for an object. And that is called inertia or Newton's first law. And it's basically that a uh, body at rest tends to stay at rest and a body in motion tends to stay, uh, keep the same motion over time unless it's acted upon by an outside force. Um, all right, so now let me ask, so then which objects are hardest to move? Massive objects or less massive objects? Type your answer into the chat. Which objects are hardest to move? More massive or less massive? Yeah, it's the more massive objects, right? Um, and we feel that sort of instinctively. If you want to push on something really uh, heavy, you get down and you use your whole body weight to try to move it, right? But if you just want to pick up a pebble from the floor, you just pick it up, no problem. Um, now, part of that, that now on Earth, we tend to, con we tend to connect two things. Um, an object that is more massive is harder to move, um, and that means that the force on an object 
is proportional to its mass and acceleration. So the stronger the force, the more the acceleration. The higher the mass, the weaker or smaller the acceleration. So that's Newton's second law, okay? Well, what do you know about gravity? Uh, if I take these two objects, let's say if I take this object right here, and its mass, the thing tells me, is 5.9. What if I crank that up to 60? Will it move as much as it did? What will happen to its gravity? Will it get stronger or weaker? You think if I increase its mass, it will get weaker? There, now we see it really pulled a lot harder on the other object, right? So its mass, as the gravity, as the mass of an object goes up, it is both harder to move and its gravity gets stronger, okay? All right, so let's take a look at how gravity works. So if I stop this object, if I stop both of these objects, and I put this one right here and I let go, which one is going to move more, the blue one on the left or the red one on the right? If I let these go, which one is going to move more, the blue one on the left or the red one on the right? The red one, okay, I'm hearing a lot of the red one. All right, let's try it. Oh, boy, it moved fast, didn't it? Let's actually move it a little farther away to make that a little easier to see. So now take a look at the blue one. Let's run that again. Take a look at the blue one. Does the blue one move? Yes, right? Let's see it one more time. So both the blue one and the red one move, but the more massive one moves less than the less massive one. And that's because even though they are feeling the same force, because the gravity in between them is the same, um, because forces are always the same on each other, that's Newton's third law, um, they're just opposite in direction. The, uh, what we see is that the be, uh, under the same force conditions, the less massive one gets accelerated more than the more massive one. So let's see that one more time. Okay, so as you predicted, things fall down, right? Well, I now want you to see what happens if I give this one a little bit of sideways velocity. What do you think is going to happen? Is it going to just so gravity is going to make things fall, right? Is it going to crash uh, into the object? Is it going to uh, orbit like crazy? What's it going to do? You don't have to type your answer and just kind of decide, kind of imagine for a minute what you think it's going to do. So it starts going off forward, but it doesn't quite hit it. Now, did it get really, really close? Yeah, it got really, really close, but it didn't quite hit it. Well, that's interesting. What do you think is going to happen if I give it a little more speed? It's going to have the exact same orbit as it did before. You think it's going to leave? Well, let's see. So it didn't quite go bye-bye. It didn't quite leave completely but it takes a much bigger orbit. So let's talk about some of the speeds we can give an orbiting object. So if I just drop the object, if I give it a zero speed and let it go, it just falls, boom, hits the object. When it intersects an object, when a say orbiting body intersects an object, we call that crashing <laughs> or hitting the object, right? But if we give it even a little bit of speed sideways, 
then gravity adds a lot of speed this way, but it doesn't subtract any of the upward speed. And so it loops around, but doesn't quite hit it. If an object falls towards an object, but has enough sideways motion that instead of hitting it, it falls around it, that's called an orbit. So one of the ways to think about orbiting is that it is falling, but missing the ground because you go so far fast sideways that you never hit the ground. If you have ever seen a video of a rocket launch, one of the things you might notice is they go up and then they very quickly turn the rocket sideways and go sideways really, really fast. Most of the energy in the rocket is rocket fuel is used to make it go sideways really fast so that when they turn off the engine and it falls back towards earth, it never hits the ground. It goes around the object so that it is in orbit because an object in space does feel gravity. A lot of people think there's no uh, gravity in um, space, but there is gravity. In fact, uh, we wouldn't be orbiting the sun if there wasn't gravity in space, right? Uh, but yeah, if they start going so fast, they can't collide. Yeah, that's pretty much right. So now if I start it again and give it a little, I'm going to move it a little closer. If I give it a little more speed. What do we get? Well, how does that orbit look to you? Does that orbit look like a circle or not? Doesn't quite look like it's a circle to me. In fact, most orbits are ellipses. So here's a nice example of an elliptical orbit. It, a slower speed makes a really strong ellipse. And we see a lot of asteroids and comets with these really strong ellipses. Um, and then if I speed it up some more, we can get a nice circle or close to a circle that's maybe a little slow for a circle. Let's see how good I can do on trying to get it to be a circle. I think I overshot. So I gave it too much velocity. And now it's a bigger ellipse instead of a small skinny ellipse. Let's go ahead and give it a little less. It's pretty hard to do. Yeah, I still think that's a little fast. Let's drop it a little more. Yeah, I like circle-ish, yeah. How's that? I think that's not a bad circle for just doing it by hand. So we have three really interesting speeds. We have speed too slow to orbit. So that depends upon how big the object is. A bigger object is easier to hit, right? So if you're too slow, you hit the object. If you have a low speed, but fast enough to orbit, then you, um, then you uh, kind of get a skinny, uh, you get an ellipse. If you go just the right speed, you get a circle. And if you go too much speed, you also get an ellipse. So the speed at which you're orbiting um, can determine what your orbit shape is. Now, if I give it, I'm going to move it really close uh, to kind of, and then let's see what it looks like if we speed it up faster. So you can have enough speed that you leave the object behind. And that is called escape velocity. So when we send a spaceship from the Earth to, say, the moon, or if we spend a, send a spacecraft to another object to study it, like to Jupiter or to Saturn, we have to give it escape velocity relative to the Earth. It has to have enough speed to leave. All right. Let's try that. So that's what that looks like. Also, you will often see comets that zip by the planet, similar to what um, Comet Swan is going to do. See how it zips by and then just goes on? Now, a comet, of course, is not nearly as much mass as the sun. Almost all of the mass in the solar system is in the sun. But this is what a comet orbit might look like, right? And this would be what's called an open orbit. It doesn't loop back around and close like an elliptical orbit does. If I slow it down a little, looks like maybe there we have a really long elliptical orbit. Slow it down even more. 
This time we might actually hit it. Nope. Oh, we did a cute little loop and then zipped off. That was kind of fun. And now we're back again. Now we're really going off. So, um, lots of fun with this thing. Uh, one thing I want to do is I'm going to add, I'm going to randomize it. Then I'm going to just add a whole bunch of objects and we can just put a bunch. What do you think is going to happen if instead of like the solar system with one big object at the center, what do you think will happen if we have a whole bunch of little objects? Some go bye-bye, some crash, some and make a big one. Sounds good. Let's see what we get. We see that a lot of them kind of smash into each other pretty quickly. And we're left with just two. Comes back around on this big orbit, right? Let's go ahead and try that again. Uh, let's randomize again and put a whole bunch in. So now I think you can see how one of the things that we know about how the solar system formed is it started out as just a cloud of gas and dust. And then over time, it turned into most of the matter ended up at the center and a little bit ended up in the, in the uh, plane of the solar system and we call that now the planets. So you can see how with a whole bunch of random things happening, a lot of time later, you can see what looks like a very stable long-term system. And this is an example of a binary system um, that's been around, that could last for a really, really, really long time. And that's what we see in the solar system. We know that uh, when the solar system formed, it was pretty chaotic. It was all pretty much moving the same direction, but there were lots of different particles having interactions, some of them being flung out of the solar system, some of them uh, ending up being flung into the sun, some of them being swallowed by Jupiter. Um, and now we just see the solar system as we see it now with a whole lot of asteroids. Yeah, this is a fun little binary system. It's pretty cool. It's kind of easy to get binary systems in this. Let's do randomize again and see what happens. Pretty common to get a little binary system there. All right, so I encourage you to find this tool and play with it. I do want to come back to the, uh, and I'll put the link to this in the chat so that everybody has it. But I've really, I've had a lot of fun playing with this one, and I think you will too. So I encourage you to play with that. Um, let's go back to our basic initial solar system setup. And I want to send us an object flying through it. And I want you to tell me what you think is going to happen. So I'm going to add a vertex, add a little object here. I'm going to give it some mass. Let's give it, let's say, let's give it about five stellar masses. And then we're going to give it a bit of a push like this. And I'm just going to send it through the solar system. What do you think is going to happen to everybody else's orbit? Is it going to be fine? Is it going to ignore it? Is it going to start orbiting something? Is it going to just zip through the solar system like a comet? Let's go ahead and see. All right, so this one, remember that this one was massive enough that it was really able to pull on that star. So you can see that this inner planet got moved a little. This planet system got moved a little. Oh, and now we've had a weird interaction. This one's really been thrown into a new and different orbit. Now, did everything smash into each other? No. Did everything go off crazy into lots of different random places? No. But it did make a big change in the orbit. You can see that the orbits are going to keep changing for a longer period of time every time it comes past. All right, uh, let's put it on a different, I'm going to make it much smaller this time and put it on another orbit. So let's see what that does. 
So this time it doesn't have enough mass for its gravity to be really be strong enough to mess up anybody's orbit. Okay. All right, the next thing I want to do is let's remove that. Let's come back to our moon Earth system. So someone asked me last week, I'm not sure if you're here, but you asked about the moon speed relative to the Earth. And you can see that it's actually going a little faster than the Earth here. But then if you watch it and it zips back to the near side, it's going slower than the Earth. But their velocity is always kind of around the same and the moon zips around the earth. Let's see what happens if we change the speed of the moon. I'm gonna drop it so that it's pretty much the same as the earth. What do you think is gonna happen? It's gonna smash into the earth? Is it gonna fall behind the earth? Is it going to zip around on its own orbit, crashes into earth and humans go bye-bye? All right, let's see. Yep, pretty much. That would be a very bad day for humans on earth. All right, what happens if I slow it way down? Just basically make it stop. That time it fell behind the Earth and now ended up on its own orbit around the sun. And yeah, it's kind of a new planet. All right, what if we give it, oops, we need to move it. Let's click at the velocity thing. What if we give it a much faster velocity? What do you think? It's gonna go off on its own. Let's see if we can get it a little slower. Oh, I didn't quite, I got it into orbit again. Okay. A little faster. Okay, it makes a quick pass and then goes off on an orbit on its own. Let's see if I can get it to not crash into the earth, but not do its own. There we go. So if it had a different speed, it could orbit the earth on a really long pass like that, or eventually even leave it. So I hope this has shown you a fun tool that you can use to play around with uh, orbits of objects in space. I think this one's really easy. There are a lot of them out there, but this is my favorite one because it's the most fun to play with. Um, you can do things like, See if you can get uh, a binary system to start. The binaries are pretty easily easy. You can see, can we get another planet maybe to be way out here and orbit separately as those two orbit each other? That's probably going to be way too fast. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's come back to my slideshow real quick quick. Uh, so I did that. So just to remind ourselves of the three laws of Newton that all of those objects were following, and I hope you saw some of that, and gravity, is everything moves in a straight line unless someone pushes or pulls on it. Our official name for that is inertia. The change in speed or direction, which we call acceleration, is proportional to the mass of the object and the force on the object. Bigger force, Bigger change in acceleration, bigger mass, smaller change in acceleration. If you've seen that law written down before, it's F equals MA. Um, every push or pull acts on both objects with the same strength, but not always the same effect. So when a massive object pulls on a less massive object, the less massive object is going to end up moving a lot more than the really massive object. That's why, um, have you ever seen those uh, videos where people uh, run at each other carrying those big giant balls and they smash into each other and maybe you have a kid and adult run into each other. Have you ever seen those? Which person goes flying more? Let me bring up my chat again. The kid, right? The kid like goes crazy off into like space. They just bounce really far. That's because their mass is a lot lower. And they had the same force acting on them when they squished in and squished back out. And so uh, they go flying a lot further because their mass is a lot smaller. All right. And then gravity. The force increases with the mass of the two bodies, but it depends upon the mass of both of the bodies. Um, and it decreases a lot with distance because that R squared term there, that R times R term, may, means that uh, a uh, little change in distance means that the, the force goes down by a lot, okay? So hopefully that's helped 
explain some of that. Now what I want to show you is a little of how we use our understanding of gravity to send objects to other planets. So how am I doing on time? Oh, I've got plenty of time. We're doing great. All right. So uh, this is NASA's eyes again. This time I have clicked specifically. You have a thing on the right where it says tours. If you click on the Cassini tour, um, Cassini was a space probe that orbited uh, Saturn and taught us a lot about Saturn by measuring. But I want to talk about how it got to Saturn. So if we zoom in on Cassini here, we can see where do we build spacecraft? We build them on Earth. So Cassini and Earth are overlapping right now. That's when it was launched. If I speed up time to the real rate, that's gonna move really slow. But if I speed it up just a bit here, you can see that when we launch it, we have to give it enough of a push that it has enough velocity to leave Earth. Remember, we have to give it escape velocity relative to Earth. Otherwise, it would fall back down to the ground. We don't want that to happen. And we're trying to get it way out here to Saturn, right? But take a look at where we send it first. So we didn't give it enough. We gave it enough push to get off of Earth. But now it's falling towards the sun. And we did that on purpose. The reason is fuel is heavy and expensive. And the scientists, instead of sending it, see how when it zipped by Venus, it sped up? That's called a gravity assist. So what we did is instead of giving it enough fuel to get all the way to Saturn on a first push, what we did instead is we planned a path that would take it by Venus. And then when we were near Venus, we used the gravity of Venus and uh, fired our rockets a little to get a boost from it. And that pulled a little bit energy out of Venus, so little that Venus will never notice. And then it speeds up the Cassini spacecraft. You can see that it went all the way out to Mars, not anywhere near Mars itself, but all the way out to Mars' orbit. And then it's falling back in again. We didn't still in that first pass, didn't get enough energy to go all the way out to Saturn. I'm gonna speed it up a little. We're going now at about one week per second. It's about as fast as it will let us go. Now we're gonna zoom, we're gonna fall back in onto Venus. You can see it speeds up as it gets close to Venus and then zoom, now it's going off again. This time it's gonna fly by Earth. Gonna pick up a little bit of energy from Earth and then go on its way out by Jupiter. Remember, take a look at Cassini's path. Is it a straight path? Kind of hard to tell, but it's not a straight path. Yeah, so I see that somebody put gravity slingshot. So uh, gravity slingshot is one of the things that we call that, but most, most scientists call it gravity assist because we think that's a little bit of a better descriptor, but it is what people are talking about when they say gravity slingshot. Uh, whoops. So, as we, so if you look at Cassini's orbit or its path, it is curving. And that is because the sun is still pulling on it, right? Because if it didn't have a force on it, it would go in a straight line. Uh, Saturn is pulling on it, or sorry, the sun is pulling on it and slowing it down and um, making it curve. And that's why it is eventually going to, uh, but that's part of the path that we planned for it. See if I can get us a better view on that. So now we're doing, whoops, we're doing another flyby of Saturn or of Jupiter this time. Sorry for not doing a great job of piloting today. There we are. All right, so we went by Jupiter. We got some extra speed. Now I'm going to speed this up because this part's pretty boring. We're going really fast now. And then as we get to Saturn, we actually are moving too fast to get caught by Saturn's gravity. It would zip by it just like we saw those comet zipping by Earth on our simulation or the sun on our simulation earlier. So what we need to do is when we get to Cassini, we have to do what's called an orbital insertion maneuver. And to do that, you have to use rockets to slow it down so that it orbits Saturn. So let's 
change our view so that we are near Saturn. And I need to slow that down because that is really dizzying. All right. So here we are in Saturn's position. Where did Cassini go? There it is. So you can see it coming in there. Speed it up a little so we can watch its orbit. So this is about a day per second. You can see that it's now on a nice elliptical orbit. We'll continue to adjust our orbit so that it can study Saturn, study the rings of Saturn, and also study the moon. So there's a nice flyby of Iapetus there to study it. And this is what Saturn did. Yeah, one of Saturn's moons does have water. Let's talk about that moon. That's where I was going to go next. So uh, Cassini orbited for, I think it was almost 12 years until we decided that uh, we needed to end its lifetime. We didn't want it to accidentally crash into Titan into the future. So we decided to crash it into Saturn. Um, and you learn something along its way there. Um, but if I click over here to Cassini images, we'll zoom me in and show me. Keep my, my Zoom video keeps ending up in the way. All right, this is a view of some things coming all out of Enceladus. And Enceladus is one of my favorite moons because it is covered in ice. We think it's covered completely in ice, but it does look like it releases some material from underneath it. So we think it has liquid water underneath. And if there's liquid water and a heat source down there, there could be life if there's the right chemistry. So Enceladus is an exciting place to look for the possibility of life in another um, uh, in, a, in a moon in the solar system. So this is one of the neat things that Cassini discovered. Um, one of my favorite pictures is this one right here. This is a picture from the backside, and let me enlarge this here, of Saturn. So the sun is behind Saturn right now, and so we're looking past Saturn at the sun. And so the rings look so eerie and ghostly because they are backlit. We are seeing them scatter light from the sun at the camera on Cassini. So this is an image that you can never get from Earth because Earth is never on the other side of the sun from Saturn. Our orbit is smaller than Saturn's orbit, so we're never on the other side. So we have to send a probe to get an image like this. What I love about this image is that Earth is in this picture, and so is Mars and Venus. And they look pretty much just like dots, and to help us find those dots, I'm going to switch us over to uh, my other view here. I keep having a Let's see, where is my image? This one. So I got this image off of NASA's uh, photo journal from Cassini. And we have three, we have four planets, Saturn, Mars, Venus, and Earth in there. So if I zoom in on Mars there, that's Mars. Tiny little, very slightly reddish dot. Venus, very slightly kind of tannish colored dot right there. And then right in here is the Earth and the Moon, very slightly bluish dot. Now, remember, every person in the world is right there inside that dot in this picture. Kind of exciting, kind of cool to see that view that we never get to see. Uh, if we want to see Earth, we look at the ground, right? Um, but this is a nice picture from really far away that reminds us that we're all in this little spaceship that we call Earth here. All right, one of my favorite pictures. Let's go ahead and zip back to here. Um, uh, let's see, uh, what was the other one I was gonna show? I think it was, let's do, this one I really like because you get to see a shadow of the rings on Venus. I think that's pretty cool. Um, I also wanna show you this one. Uh, this one. Yeah. So this is Titan. Um, Titan is one of my favorite moons. It's really big, but it also has an atmosphere. And what's really exciting about Titan, something that we learned because Cassini dropped a probe onto Titan, um, it has a very thick atmosphere, which we already knew. It has lots of clouds. 
but it has a cycle similar to the water cycle, but instead of water, it's methane. So methane on Earth is a gas. Uh, we use it to, for heat and such. It's uh, one of the natural gases. Um, and uh, methane is a very, very simple gas. But on Titan, it's cold enough that it's liquid and gas and ice, or frozen, and not really ice because it's not water, right? So um, methane has its own cycle. It rains methane. It makes rivers and lakes of methane. It's really interesting. Um, I think that's a fun place to go. And we are going to send a couple of probes. There's a probe called Dragonfly that's going to go to uh, go to Titan. Um, definitely not safe to breathe there. When we say it has an atmosphere, we mean it has some gas around it. Not the right kind of gas for our, our uh, uh, lungs to breathe. Not good for us. Um, I'm also, I'm not sure what the temperature or the pressure is. It's probably too low pressure, but I'm not, not sure of that. I'd have to look that up. Um, but anyway, so these are some of my favorite discoveries. And I encourage you, remember that you can download NASA's eyes yourself. You can look at a lot of the different details they have on missions and look at some of these pictures yourself as well. So um, thank you all for your attention. I'm going to switch us back off of the screen share now. And let me... Let's see if we go to speaker view, or I'll go to gallery view. Uh, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate your you taking your time to uh, listen to me talk about some space stuff today. If anyone has any more questions, please put them in the chat bar. We can stick around for a few minutes. You are very welcome, Nikki. Nikki is someone I know. Thanks for joining us. Any questions? When is it going to be posted and where? When is what going to be posted? Do you mean a recording of this? Oh, are we going to have another one? Yes, we will have another one on May 7th. Um, it will be the same Zoom ID, so it'll be next Thursday. There will be one at 1.30 and one at 7, just like we've been doing. I uh, haven't fully decided if we're going to um, uh, uh, extend this past May 7th, but I'm kind of thinking we probably will because they're pretty easy to do and I've been having a lot of fun doing them. Uh, the recording. Uh, so I'm sorry that we didn't post last week's recording. That's my fault. We will get that posted. Uh, I should be able to get this one to the uh, people over in College of Science Communications that help me post these things. So it should be posted probably tomorrow, I hope, will be when they do something. Um, so what I do is I will do something different next week. Um, I don't know what I'm going to talk about next week. Uh, maybe it'll be more comet stuff if that comet is visible. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think, um, I think, I don't know what I'm going to do next week, but it will be something different. So every week will be different, but the 1.30 and the 7 are always the same content. But of course, people ask me different questions, so I get to asking different things about them. So, um, any other questions? Oh, when will we be able to see the Swan asteroid? It probably in a, about a week or so. I think probably sometime next week would be when it's visible. Um, I'm going to try to come up with a way to get you information about that um, that doesn't require another one of these meetings because it might be that there's good information that happens in between the weekly meetings that we're doing or presentations that we're doing. So. Uh, next week, I'm going to look at starting up an email list, or tomorrow, I'm going to look at starting up an email list. So I will make sure that in the same ways that we've shared these things, I can share that so that you can all get on that. Um, I also will probably, if we have something really exciting, maybe I'll do a short video um, and post it on the College of Science Facebook uh, uh, site or the college, and the College of Science YouTube site um, just to talk about what you can do to go see that. Um, so. Uh, I will let you know about that. Okay, any questions? It's about five after eight. You are welcome, Paige.
Okay, see you next week. I encourage you all, please play with that, um, uh, play with that uh, gravity simulator and let me know if you've managed to make it do anything super cool. I like, I think it's fun to try to make a binary and then see if you can get something else to orbit outside the binary. That can be a lot of fun. All right, bye everybody. Thanks for coming. And I appreciate um, all of your attention and uh, working with me today. So hopefully we'll keep doing these. Thanks a lot. Bye everybody.